as you hear. <laughs> How are you doing, Greg Paris? Woo! Woo! Well, so we decided to do something really spontaneous. Um, let's sing. Um, piano, maestro, <laughs> improvise. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So, our next speaker, <laughs> his name is Josh. He's an educator from the joy of react as a fun fact oh john is a software developer from montreal canada he's worked in organizations like can academy digital ocean and unsplash <laughs> oh <laughs> josh wants should I keep going? Came in. <laughs> <laughs> Let's improvise. <laughs> Josh once came in the second place in a regional yo yo contest and suppressed emails in the DB Prod once. Oopsie. Welcome on stage, Josh. It's your turn. <laughs> I hope you like it. <laughs> so it's time to warmly welcome Josh, multi talented as you can see. I wish all conferences had pianos because it really is like it's good for the nerves, right? And you get sort of yeah. settled in. You want me to take your bag? If you want, I can put it in the stairs. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah. That would be great. So I'm plugged in. Ah, there I am. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Um, it was a year ago, a little bit less, when Vercel officially released Next 13.4, which ushered in this new era that we're in with uh, their app router and React server components. And it's been pretty cool, right? It's been uh, a lot of interesting new doors are open. But you can't make an omelet without cracking a few eggs. And there has been a bit of turbulence in terms of you know, all the patterns and tools that we've been using for the first decade of React's existence. And for myself, I really like styled components, and I know that like, it's not everyone's favorite tool, but I really like it. And you know, I want to keep using the tool that I like, and it's not really clear how that goes. You know what? Actually, um, I want to grab a water from my bag. There's one here? Ah. Well, this isn't mine, though. <laughs> I have one in my bag. One moment, please. So you know, um, if you've been using these tools, you've probably seen just like the amount of confusion around how to actually use server components with emotion, with style components. And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to explore like what the options are. So if you want to keep using style components, we're going to talk about what the problems are and what the possible solutions are. And you know, I recognize that. Not everybody uses these tools. Maybe you use Tailwind. Um, and so you might be thinking, is this talk actually relevant for me? Am I going to learn anything? And yes. Um, the first thing is that not like, so it's true. Tailwind has dodged the bullet when it comes to compatibility with server components. But not everything in the Tailwind ecosystem has been so lucky. Like TW Merge, for example, it's going to run into all the issues that we're talking about today. So, it is still good to understand what the problems are and what the solutions are. But even more broadly than that, I don't know why I'm having trouble just regulating my breath, which is always uh, how it goes. Um, yeah, even if we assume that you're using tools that dodge these problems, well, 
there's still sort of this monumental shift that's happening in terms of how we use React. And so it's good to understand what those problems are. It's also good to understand how server components works, because this is really going to be a big part of the ecosystem. So part one, making sense of server components. This is sort of like a hello world of how server components works. And we see that we're telling React that we have a, uh, or rather, we're telling style components that we want to get a button. Is this a good size? I think it is. Yeah, I'll make it a little bigger. We're essentially saying that we want a button, and we want that button to have this CSS. And if we render this out, we get HTML that looks like this, where, sure enough, I've been given a button. That button has whatever content I've applied. But this is interesting. I haven't given it a class name. It's sort of generated a class name based on the styles. And it's added it to the style tag. So in the head of my document, I have this new style that has whatever styles I've provided. And they get injected in like this. And I think for a lot of developers who have been using style components for a while, it's still not entirely clear how we get from this to this. So let's actually like build really quickly a miniature version of this to see how it works. And I think the first thing that trips people up is that we have this, uh, what appears to be an object, with what appears to be a property. And then out of nowhere, this backtick just shows up. <laughs> like, you know, this isn't how JavaScript works, is it? Uh, this uses a feature known as tagged template literals. And essentially, like, what we can sort of do, and it's not exactly the same, but we can imagine that it's like this, where this is a method. We are invoking it as a function, and we're passing in a string of the styles that we want. Now, it's not exactly the same, because it handles interpolations differently. Like, if I had something like this, that's going to be a little bit different. But for our purposes, we can assume it's the same thing. And in fact, I want to go a little bit further. And I want to pretend, or at least like in our new version of this, I want to do something like this, where now we have a single function, and it takes two arguments. Or, yeah, two arguments. The first is the thing that we want to produce, and the second is the styles that we want it to have. And in fact, I'm going to rename it to create styled component. Essentially, this function is like a factory. Like we're saying, OK, I need a new React component. It needs to use this tag and have these styles. And this whole thing spits out a component that I can use like any other component. And I was going to do this all live, but I realized that like, we have limited time together, and I don't want to spend too, too much time on it. So let's just jump to the solution. This is what I think of as like, the most minimal way to do this. The first thing that we need to do is come up with the unique class name. So we're taking in the styles, and we're using a hashing algorithm. And I should say, like, in this case, uh, this function is not defined anywhere. I am going to put a list at the end of this talk that has a bunch of resources. And one of those resources is uh, a code sandbox that has like, the actual implementation. So if you're curious about how these functions work, you'll be able to dig into that. But essentially, for now, we're going to assume that given the string like, that we have down here, color red, it's going to spit out A, B, C. One, two, three. And it's like almost random. Like it is deterministic based on the input, but it's like a unique value that identifies these styles. Then we're going to return this component. And I know for myself, like it was years before I was really comfortable with like you have a function that returns a function that returns something. Like that just always hurt my brain. But we can think of it if we grab this function and like let's give ourselves more space. Um, we call this function, it spits out this component, and we are assigning it to this variable. Now, the thing is, thanks to the magic of closures, uh, this, come on. this component will also have access to the tag that we specified and the styles. And for the tag, like I'm specifying I want a button, it's going to render that button. It's also going to render the class name that we've generated, as well as any other props. So like I have this ID that I've added just to like show that we can do whatever we want. Um, all that stuff is going to be collected over here and spread in. Now, with just that, right? if that was all we did, then we would have, in this HTML, we would have this, we would have a class name, but it wouldn't link to anything. That's where I have this use effect, which like, isn't really how style components works, to be clear, but it's the easiest way I could think of to uh, actually apply these styles. Can you think of anything wrong with this? Like, think about it for a second. Would this actually work? Like, what are the downsides here? Well, it works OK, except for with server-side rendering. 
Because, you know, um, and fortunately, a couple of the talks today have already covered this, so I don't have to go too deep into this. Um, but server-side rendering will generate the initial HTML, but that HTML, uh, or rather, that server-side render, will not run the effect. And so the HTML that we'll generate will include the button, it'll include the class name, but it won't include this style tag, because this is what we were saying, uh, and I guess I didn't really cover this, but it takes the class name, it takes the styles, and it'll add a style tag to the head with that style definition. And so this is going to lead, like if we didn't have this in the initial HTML, it's going to lead to, lead to a flash of unstyled content. And obviously, that's not good. Fortunately, like none of this is new. Like We've had style components for years. We've had server-side rendering for years. And uh, the solution for this, which is going to look a little bit different depending on which meta framework you're using, but at least in like Next.js, it looks something like this. And essentially, we're going with a registry approach. So this is a component that's going to sit at the very top of our application, and it's going to wrap around everything. And we're going to make an object available to the entire React tree. And our goal is going to be to collect all of the different key value pairs for all of the different style definitions. So the button we saw, we said the class name was ABC123, and it uh, created these styles. We can imagine a different style component somewhere else on the page might use this class with these styles. To do this, like to actually collect all the styles, we're going to take this object and make it available through context. So I have this provider down here. I'm setting that as the value. And again, this wraps around the entire application. So um, in order for this to work, we have to make a little bit of a change to the factory that we had, this create style component factory. Essentially, we're getting rid of the effect, because that's not going to work well with server-side rendering. And instead, we're going to pluck this object out of context, and we're going to mutate it. So if this object, I was kind of hoping the, uh, the green text would apply here, but I guess it doesn't matter. Um, this object, like we're going to modify it so that ABC123 is defined as whatever the styles are for this particular, uh, particular styled component. Uh, we're going to do this for all of them. And then, uh, still in the server side render, because this is all happening on the server on request, we're going to use this really cool hook called use server inserted HTML. Anyone ever heard of this hook? Cool, I see a couple of hands. This is part of the new uh, Next app router. And I like to think of it as use effect, but for the server. So after it's rendered all of this stuff, right from the very top all the way down, Right before the server releases the HTML to the client, it's going to call this function. And whatever I return gets appended to the head of the document. So this is how uh, I'm going to take all these styles that I've collected and slap it into the head of the document and send that along to the client, which means like with this approach, the initial HTML that the client receives is fully formed, including the style tag with all the styles. Problem solved, right? We figured it out. Um, but of course, none of this is new. Uh, this is how we've solved this problem for many years. What is the problem then? Like, Why have we been hearing that server components has this incompatibility? Well, to understand that, we have to understand how React server components works. And again, thanks to the, uh, the talks that my colleagues have given earlier today, I can go through this a little bit more quickly. But essentially, um, I think the way to look at this is to work through a pretty generic example of maybe we have like an e-commerce website and let's first talk about this in the context of a client-side rendering framework. So suppose that we have, like we're using the use SWR library here, but it would be the same thing if we used React Query or GraphQL or anything else. Uh, there's no server-side rendering, so we're only working on the client. Um, data will initially be null, loading will be true. And so for that initial render on the client, we'll render a loading state. While that's happening or while we're showing that, we make the request to our API to grab the shoes or whatever else we're selling in this e-commerce store. Uh, and then once it comes in, we can render it. And we can visualize this something like this, where, uh, again, this is client-side rendering. So the initial HTML is totally empty. There's no UI. The client receives that. It has to download all the JavaScript. It has to render the shell, so we get like the header and the footer and some sort of loading state. But only then can it actually make the request to, the net, to our backend API to grab the data. We'll grab it out of the database, shoot it back as JSON, and then finally, we can re-render the application and show the user our content. 
The problem with this, though, is that like, this is the most important thing, right? Like, if the user is coming to our sneaker store, presumably they want to see the sneakers that we have for sale. And it's quite a lot of stuff that has to happen before we get to that point. Now, let's forget everything we know about server-side rendering and just think this through. Like, how could this work? How should this work? Well, if the server is the one generating the HTML, then surely we can do what we've been doing in PHP or Ruby on Rails and grab the data during that server-side render. So maybe we'll do something like this, where I'll say data is equal to database.query. And of course, you know. This is going to depend based on whatever uh, database we're using. But something like this, grab the shoes from the database. We no longer have a loading state, so we'll render something like this. Pretty cool, right? Like, Why isn't this how it works? And the answer, at least historically, has been because there's this contract with server-side rendering, which is we do the first render on the server to generate the HTML, but then we have to do the exact same thing on the client and we can't, right? Like we can't run this code on the client because the client doesn't have database access, and it shouldn't. Like we're not going to include our database credentials in our client-side bundle. It would also mean another network request, and there isn't a way. Like we can't say like if server, then do this. Like this has not been an option in React. Now uh, there has been solutions for this in the third-party space for quite a while. So for example, in Next.js for several years now. The solution has looked like this. And the next team had this pretty clever idea, which is, OK, our React code has to run first on the server and then on the client, and that code has to do the same thing. It has to produce the same UI. Um, and by the way, the reason it has to do that is that we still need React to run on the client, and React has to adopt all the HTML that was generated by the server. So like the server is going to render a main tag and an h1 and everything else, and then the client has to say, OK, let me come up with my own mental picture for what's going on here, and let me fit it to the DOM that I was given by the server. Um, so what Next did was they said, OK, uh, we'll do the same thing on the server and the client, but I'll have this other function that only runs on the server. They called it get server side props. And the idea is that it connects to the database, it grabs all the data, and whatever I return here gets fed in to the component. Pretty clever, right? Um, and it works great. It, there's no real issue with this. But given what our intuition tells us about like, how this could work, doesn't it feel a little bit like a workaround? It feels a little bit like we've said, OK, we have this sort of annoying condition in React, so let's work around that with this kind of clever solution. But really, we should be able to do this within the component itself. And there are some downsides to this. Like in this version of Next, this function can only be provided at the very top, so at the page level. We can't do this sort of wherever we want. Well, that's where React Server Components comes in. React Server Components gives us the ability to say, OK, this, where's my mouse? My screen is kind of dim. Um, this component is going to be a server component. And the idea now is that this is like a whole new thing. Like we have a special kind of component that will only render on the server. Um, and in like a server-side rendering context, it's used to generate the HTML, um, as well as like a JavaScript description that the client will reuse. That's an implementation, implementation detail that I'm going to sort of gloss over. Um, but essentially, this is their solution. And the way that they square the circle of like, well, how is React on the client going to adopt this? It doesn't really. Like, none of this JavaScript code will rerun on the client. Instead, the server will share the mental picture that it generated, right? Because all of this is JavaScript. So it generates a bunch of JavaScript objects. In a React server components world, we shove those JavaScript objects into our HTML, and React just takes it like, as a given that this component produced those objects. And what this means is that there's like an invincibility bubble, that React cannot modify any of this UI. If we want to use React the way we always have, we have this new declaration use client. And like, essentially, this restores all of the functionality that we've had with React. There's an important thing here that is, I've seen so much confusion around it. A client component, which is what we get when we use this declaration, 
it's a new name for the thing we've always had. It's not a new concept, right? Um, a client component does actually render on the server. The name suggests that it only renders on the client, but really what we're saying is that like, server components are the new things, server components only render on the server, client components are what we've always had. So just like a nice little clarification there. Okay. Why is there a problem here? Like at this point, we've covered how style components works, we've covered the deal with React server components, it's probably not clear what the incompatibility is. The trouble is that server components are like a limited subset of overall React. We can't use state. And it sort of makes sense when we think about it, like if I look at this client component and if I make it a server component, well, when we do the server-side render, count is going to be zero, so it'll produce the following UI. But then what would happen if we tried changing the state? Well, in a server component, we can't change this markup because this code runs on the server, but none of this code gets included in our JavaScript bundle, and uh, React does not hydrate this component. So it never actually runs this code on the browser, and this is what allows us to do database queries because none of the code makes it into our bundle. But it also means we can't ever change anything. So we can't use state because if the state variable were to change, it would cause a re-render, and that's not a concept in server components. We also can't use effects, and this is for like a similar reason, that effects only run on the client after hydration, and none of the code in our server components makes it to the client. But then this is interesting. We can't use context. And this one to me is a little bit weird, because like in my mind, context is a series of tubes that sits behind our application that allows us to like feed data in at one end and pull it out of the other. And you know, like there's no reason that shouldn't work in server components, but it doesn't. And it doesn't because like, it's kind of a hard problem. Like The React team is actively researching this and seeing if they can find a way to make it work. But I suppose it is kind of complicated, because you have to have a system that works both in server components and client components, and that's like tricky business. And this is the problem, because if we think back to our implementation, we were using context. And like as a reminder, uh, we needed to do this because we need each and every styled component to like communicate its styles upwards, to say, like, OK, the, the component that we're rendering over here, it's going to have whatever class name, and it's going to have whatever styles. And we need to pass those up to the parent so that when we're generating the HTML, we can have a fully formed document with the styles to avoid the flash of unstyled content. But we can't do this in server components. And so like, what we wind up with is a situation where every single component that creates a styled component has to be a client component. We have to add this directive. And this is kind of a bummer, right? Because like, I don't know about you, but for me, 95% of my React components have at least one style, like a little bit of padding or a flex container or something. So if we go this way, we're not really going to get the benefit of server components because we're not going to be able to use them in most of our work. There's other stuff too, like in server co or in styled components rather. There's something called theme provider, which allows us to specify a bunch of design tokens like breakpoints and we can pluck them out wherever we need them. Super nice, uh, but this also relies on context under the hood. It's important to talk about this idea of like runtime versus compile time. Style components and emotion and libraries like it were always built to run at runtime, which means all this work, like figuring out the class name and uh, generating the style, all of that happens live, like when the page is requested. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are other libraries that work at compile time, and these libraries can sort of sidestep this entire issue, because if we can do this work ahead of time, when we build our site, when we generate our bundles, when we compile our TypeScript, all the work that we have to do to get our site to be production ready, if we can do this work then, then all of our styled components can be server components. And this brings us to part four, which is a look at the ecosystem, um, because, you know, um, it's been sort of a thing for a while. Zero runtime CSS libraries. There's a bunch of those, right? This is an incomplete list. Uh, there's quite a few more. But what do we think about this? Like, let's say that, like, for, in my case, for example, I have two real world projects, my blog and my course platform, that together have something like 5,500 styled instances, so a styled div or a styled button. 
even if this was like one of these was the best library ever, I don't have the weeks or months it would take to go through and make 5,500 edits to update to some totally different UI. And there's no code mods. I heard that actually StyleX, they're working on one. But at least for now, there's no like, automated migration process. But even if there was, like, or even if I was starting a brand new project and migration wasn't a concern, I just really like the styled API. I've been using it for years. I've come up with like a series of patterns that really sort of work quite well that I don't even know if they're possible in most other tools. So like, given that, right? given that there is uh, really cool patterns and no technical reason that we should need a runtime to do most of what we do with styled components, um, there ought to be a way for this to work. And one of the libraries you may have heard of is Panda CSS. And it's sort of like, it's interesting, Panda's like seven different things. Like there's a bunch of different ways to use it. But one of those ways looks an awful lot like styled components, where, like, look at this. It's the same code, right? Style.button. We have the weird backtick. We have the styles. The only difference is that we're importing it from this sort of generated directory that we get with Panda CSS. But there's a problem with it. The problem is that it's not actually uh, working under the same sort of mechanism. And actually, let me stay with this for a second. Let's say I had two different things. So maybe I also have font weight bold. The way Panda CSS works is that it grabs each and every single CSS declaration and it turns it into a utility class. So sort of like Tailwind, right? It's going to create a new utility for color red. Then it's going to create a new utility for font weight bold. And you know, it wouldn't necessarily actually, I'm just sort of making up short versions here. But this is sort of how it works. It finds each and every single CSS declaration. It creates a utility class for them. It puts them in one big CSS file. And then the, all of this compiles away. So there is no more red button component. Come on, selection. Work with me. Uh, it would just become a button. And the problem with this is that it doesn't allow for cross-references within our style definitions. And I know that's probably not meaningful. Let's look at an example. Suppose I have a text link component, and I want to say, OK, when I'm using this text link on its own, I want it to have certain styles. When that component is rendered within another component, I want it to have different styles. This is what this looks like in styled components, where I say, OK, I have my aside, which is the sort of parent in this example. Then I have a bunch of styles that exist on the text link. And then this is the really magical part. I'm saying when the current element, which is represented by this ampersand, um, is within an aside, and I'm just interpolating it right in, then apply these styles to the text link. And so to me, it's like the same idea as uh, Tailwind, which is like all of the styles for a single element should be grouped in one place. It's that same idea, but taken even further, because now uh, it's not only the styles that apply to this element by default, it's like the contextual styles of when this element happens to be rendered within another one. And it's such a lovely pattern. Like this is sort of a trivial example, not necessarily like the most impressive. Um, but once you get into the habit of doing this, you find all sorts of places where it's just like a really cool way um, to set up your styles. And it doesn't work in Panda CSS, because Panda CSS generates a bunch of utility classes for this. So it'll generate a utility class for this declaration. But it doesn't really give you a way to like, express this relationship. Now, there's another library called Linaria. Anyone heard of Linaria? I see like three hands, four hands. Um, this is what's wild to me, is that it's not new. It's been around for like four or five years. And it was like the first real player to the game of compile time libraries. And it's super clever. What it does is it takes our style components, and rather than compiling them to utility classes like Panda CSS does, it compiles them to CSS modules. So all of the styles, if we look at uh, I guess this example works. Um, all of this would be put into a CSS module under a generated class, and that class would be imported and applied to the element. And this allows for all the really cool patterns. Um, it also, like, the really clever thing about this to me is that the people at Linaria said, let's not reinvent the wheel. Like, there's all this tooling support for CSS modules. It's the first class support in just about every meta framework. Let's compile to that. Let's leverage the existing tooling that exists. And let's take this API that people like and compile to it. And it works super, super, super well. Um, but it's been around for a few years. And so like, the bindings for Next.js haven't been updated since long before the app router and React server components was released. 
Someone did, so this is next Linaria. Someone created next with Linaria that has been updated recently, but there's a big warning telling you not to use it in production because it's you know, just one guy hacking on it. Um, so this is like the perfect solution in my mind, but it's not something I feel comfortable using or recommending. Fortunately, there's a whole world happening here. There's a bunch of things that are underway. What you want in JS. This is a package that was actually pulled out of Linaria, which encapsulates this logic of compiling to CSS modules. So it's the core mechanism of Linaria, but isolated and created as a low-level tool so that we can build libraries on top of it. And people have been doing this. So for example, NextYak is a project created by a couple of Swiss developers. They work for the largest e-commerce retailer in Switzerland. And they have this big e-commerce app that uses styled components, and they're running into the same issue. So their solution is to build a tool that has the closest API to styled components possible. So they've re-implemented re a bunch of the APIs. Very cool project. There's also Pigment CSS. And this is something created by the MUI team, so the team behind the Material UI Component Framework, because that framework is built on Emotion, and they're running into these issues too, where people are trying to use their component library in a modern Next app and hitting this problem. And so they're building their own tool also built on top of what you want in JS. And what's really exciting to me about this is that the MUI team is putting real resources behind it. And if slash when they migrate their tool from Emotion to this new Pigment library, it means that it's immediately going to be one of the most widely used battle-tested CSS libraries, right? Just from the scale of MUI. So I really have my eye on this. I'm really excited. It was only released a couple of weeks ago. So like this stuff is just happening right now. So finally, I have 48 seconds left. So we can really uh, I timed this perfectly. Um, what should you do if you have one of these applications? Well, interestingly, I actually don't think you have to do anything. Like There's this misinformation out there. Uh, people really uh, seem to think the situation is worse than it is. A new application created today that uses Next 14 is just as fast, just as performant, actually slightly faster than a Next application created a year ago or two years ago with styled components. People think that like it's incompatible with server-side rendering. That's not true. The only incompatibility is with React server components. And so if we use these tools now, um, we can't fully take advantage of this new optimization. But it's not the end of the world. Like If your application is already performant, you don't lose anything. It's just that, like, it's funny, actually. The biggest issue is FOMO. Like, we all want to be using the newest, shiniest tool. And so it's kind of like it's lame that we can't, or like it's not cool that we can't take advantage of this thing and add the, or omit the use client directive and get this nice little performance boost. But ultimately, it's not going to make a huge impact on the user experience or like the business that we're running, whatever we're building. Um, so it really isn't like the end of the world in my mind. But like we've been talking about, there's a bunch of cool stuff that's been being sort of that's flying under the radar right now. And it really sort of feels like there's a little bit of a renaissance happening. And if we give it a few months, we're going to have some pretty cool options. So you can learn more about all the tools that I've talked about and see the code for that little demo earlier at joshwcomo slash react Paris. That's my talk. Thanks so much. Woo!